Welcome to the House by Store podcast. I'm your host, William, and joining me, Derek. Hello. And this is kind of a special bonus episode, I guess you could say. So we're going to be discussing Avengers Endgame, um, mostly just because it's a movie that is making or breaking so many box office records that uh, it's going to be somewhat culturally significant and relevant here soon. And um, I, mean, making, I, think it, I think it's fair to say that it, it is. I mean, because I think at this point they haven't put any official numbers out, but at Friday it already made 1.9. So I say it's probably billion worldwide. Yeah, so I say it's probably crossed the two billion dollars. So by the end of this weekend, it's probably going to be the number two grossing movie worldwide of all time. And it's only been out two weeks. <laughs> and it'll be behind Avatar. And if it can catch up to Avatars to be seen so far, if any movie is going to do it, it's going to be this one. Uh, until inflation catches up and, you know, thirty years from now most things can break those records. Because a lot of, you know, box office records that seemed unbreakable, you know, decades ago are now easily broken by the majority of films released just because yeah. of inflation. And but that's also assuming that people continue going to theaters at the rate they do now, that theaters exist in the format they're in now. And then I think, too, like the one thing is kind of cool, because I mean, I remember seeing Avatar in theaters and remember it being like a big deal. But, you know, that was 10 years ago well, at this point. So. And the big thing that sold it, like, beyond the, the movie's story or the actors or the director was the technology aspect. Yeah. Because it had 3D stuff going on on screen that you just literally couldn't replicate at home. Yeah. So, I mean, there are 3D sets or 3D TVs people did buy in the years past. <laughs> but that sold, those sold relatively low numbers. And it wasn't the same as seeing a huge screen. Yeah. Uh, properly calibrated. I, just, it, I think the one thing that's kind of cool is, like, you know, I mean, they did the... They've rebooted the. I don't want to say rebooted, but they've done you know the current Star Wars trilogy is going on. Yeah, and even that though, I still don't think was like on the same level as the original. Well, Star the Wars. Dif- a big difference. So you know, before getting into like a big difference with the 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 global presence of say these new Marvel films versus Star Wars. So Star Wars released you know in the late seventies and eighties, and then the popularity was you know the 70s 80s 90s when they had the D- the VHS re-releases and the special editions on DVD and all that stuff and you had the prequels so Star Wars stayed in American popular culture pretty heavily for decades yeah. and kids grew up with it and they had the toys and all this stuff well globally in China they didn't get those movies uh they didn't you know because at the time they weren't importing a ton of American films so people in China in the 70s and 80s and 90s didn't really grow up with Star Wars so there wasn't as much love or affinity for it as there is here. And then if they go to rewatch them in the 2000s or current day, they're like, oh, and, and A New Hope, the lightsaber fighting is really bad. And, yeah. you know, it's only really in the second and third film where they have, you know, any decent choreography whatsoever to the fights. So they just watch them like, oh, man, these are hard to watch. We don't like it. So they don't really care about the new ones. All these Marvel films launched in 2008 with Iron Man, and they are all more well, I mean, uh, you, you modern. Had, so ones globally, before, yeah. people who you know, only started getting regular access to American films like in the past 20, 30 years, they've been able to watch these from the start and be invested in it. So it's made a big global deal compared to some of these older franchises that are bigger here and, you know, still do global box office, but just not to the same level. You know, I guess my point though too was like, I don't like, we've never really seen anything like this as far as like phenomenon. Cause it's like, and I've seen it twice and it's been a really good mixture of people, old and young, and different races. It's not just all white guys our age and they're seeing it. Yeah. So it's kind of cool going to see a movie. And both times I've seen it was at 9.30. One was on a Saturday. One was on a Friday. A.M. A.M. Sold out both times. And both times, just a complete mixture of people. And you get different crowd. And those different types of people gave different crowd reactions. And we'll get more into that in the spo- yeah. spoilers. Yeah, we'll hold off on spoilers but till the end. It is very nice to see people that are our parents' age that were excited for different parts of well, the movie and, and or just young kids that get it which is something that we don't because when we were kids like we had movies like that but they weren't like this well and the you other know. like a big uh, another big thing is that a lot of people complained like oh the social justice warrior stuff they're shoving down our throats so that women can be heroes and blah 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 but i mean like just but look at the movie you know, little boys and girls of all kinds of different backgrounds come out of it with the character that they identify with and want to go out to the playground and pretend to be. Yeah. So even if you hate the Marvel films and all that stuff, from that aspect alone, it's doing some good. Well, it's kind of cool for, you know, 
a little girl or somebody of a different race to go to a store and get an action figure and have the cool character. Yeah. You know, you're like Black not Panther. Not the sidekick. Yeah, not the, not the sidekick. You know, you get Black Panther or you can get somebody like the Wasp or you can get, you know, Captain I mean, Marvel, Captain Marvel or Valkyrie. Or any these, or... Yeah, like any of these characters that are actually legitimately cool and they're not just... Like with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, not to poke on them, but you have April, right? Yeah, because I remember, like, I remember it being a kid and being out on a playground, and there were, you know, boys and girls, and then there's, there, I don't like, I don't remember the specifics. Let's just say, for instance, there are six boys. So you have two Leonardos and two Michelangelos, and blah blah blah. And then the girl, like, uh, younger girls, like, oh, well, I'll just be Donatello. Like, no, 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 you're April. We have to save you. Yeah. So and it, now it's you know there's yeah. so much more with that. I think that's the cool thing though is just because like when you use about toys like the, the you always. I think maybe you go in there, you see, and it's just kind of nice that they have representation now where it's actually cool stuff. It's not like the lame stuff that's always on the shelf that nobody wants. It's, it's cool. So I mean, because there were there were different things like. You know, because going back to when, like, when I was a kid, the first iteration of Power Rangers in, like, 93 or whatever did have female Power yeah, Rangers. Yeah, that was but, a little bit different. Yeah. But but they also pulled the issue of where the, the female Ranger was pink, and then the Black Ranger was an African American who was yeah. black, and then the Yellow Ranger was an Asian woman. <laughs> and I think, actually, in the Japanese original, the Yellow Ranger was a man. Yes, actually, why, all the Power Rangers were actually men, even if it was the Pink Ranger. It, just, it had a two, skirt. It had a skirt, but it was just a guy in a skirt. Because right. all that stuff, from what I've learned, was actually shot from the original show. Yeah, using they just different. Yeah, yeah. Yes. they just reshot the actor part. Okay, so to get into yeah. Avengers Endgame without spoilers until we get to the spoiler section. So this movie is three hours long, and it's the culmination of 11 years of film releases and what is like 21 prior movies. Yeah. So you have a bunch of movies that you need to have seen to get the most out of this because it does, you know, because, you know, it's a culmination. It has all this new material, but it also references some stuff from those past films. Which is kind of a nice nod because like the Russo brothers with the rest of development days and stuff and different stuff. Yeah, because um, so they like, have so they were also directors who worked on the show community yeah. and throughout the movies they've had community number of actors. the community people cameo yeah. because like Donald Glover was in Spider-Man Homecoming which they didn't have anything to do with but he was there because um, there was a big campaign when they were doing the the relaunch of Spider-Man people wanted him to be cast as Spider-Man and um, and then in the most recent movie um I saw uh, Ken Jeong was in it mm. in a very yeah. brief role, and um, a, a vet Nicole Brown, who was in Community as well, was in it yeah. in a small role. So it is funny to see that. But and we've had uh, in Civil War, uh, the dean, dean. <laughs> was uh, there, and there's just been some different. But one thing I was with them is uh, like, well, like the Russo brothers, and this is the rest of the development in general, like they, the original. Like, they always had really good callbacks that made sense. Every single thing that happened in that TV show happened for a purpose. This movie. Every single thing that had happened in the Marvel Universe was not an accident. Like, they're, they're, this all kind of neatly... Well, and two, so there are some, some movies, so you absolutely need to have seen Infinity War for this one. Oh, yeah, 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 you have seen Infinity War. You need to have seen Civil War. Yeah. Um, Pretty much any of the big tentpole, like in Avengers, Ultron, Civil War... Uh, Thor Ragnarok. Thor Ragnarok, because that pretty much sets... That's, like, that's the movie that uh, Infinity War comes... Pretty much directly. And then two, after. like you still, I think, need to have seen Ga uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume One and Two. Yeah, just get. So familiar. there's a lot of movies that you need to have seen going into this, and you know, like there's some of them. So um, Thor: The Dark World, I've never seen that movie from beginning to end. No, <laughs> and like I think it even did reference some stuff from that. So I think yeah. they referenced like most of the corners of the universe. Yeah, uh, Winter Soldier actually was pretty. It, it yeah, was a movie that you Captain needed. America, the yeah. Winter Soldier had some references and callbacks. And obviously like, any of the Iron Man movies. Like, it's just funny because it made every single movie somewhat important because like even the Ant-Man movies came into play. And it, But it, it was one of those things where if you just literally had watched Infinity War and this, I think you're fine. You yeah, because I think you overall get a, a good enough idea of what's going on. There's a lot of little, you know, nuggets and Easter eggs and callbacks that you wouldn't necessarily pick up on if you hadn't seen all those prior films. But, yeah. you know, the movie itself, so... You know, if you've seen Infinity War, I think this is a vastly different type of film because uh, Infinity War was you bring all these different characters from different portions of the Marvel Universe together and you watch them interact and you see how it goes. And, and, and this will assume full spoilers for Infinity War. We are assuming yeah. you have seen Infinity War if you're seeing <laughs> yeah. Endgame. And, you know, actually, and Infinity War is on Netflix now, too. Yeah, pretty much any Marvel movie, spoiler for, except for until we get to this part, because there, there's certain things that are going to be spoiled in those movies because... 
you have to have some kind of context, you know. Because, you know, the prior Marvel films, the first time the characters had really, quote unquote, lost was Civil War, where Baron Zemo, who is just a normal guy, you know, like a soldier, just a normal guy whose family had died, he was able to pit the Avengers against each other and succeeded in that goal. So that's really the first time they'd really suffered like a major setback where at the end of it, they weren't, I mean, it's like uh, age of Ultron, the Hulk left the planet after yeah. that movie and, <laughs> and stuff. I mean like the, and there were characters who died in that because um Quicksilver died in age of Ultron. Oh, no. So it, it, it's funny because there was, um was the movie kick ass. It had uh, a, uh, Aaron Taylor Johnston and Evan Peters who both played Quicksilver in different movies. Yeah. So that's a callback to that kind of, not really a callback, it's just a weird coincidence. That, but, that both happened. Now they're both in the Marvel Universe, so. Yeah, but the movie, you know, there's a lot of these prior films that, you know, knowing about gives you a little bit more to enjoy in this newest one. Um, and, you know, you have all these different characters that are coming together. And like I said, you know, assuming you've seen Infinity War, you start the movie out with a lot of the characters off the playing field, you know, off the checkerboard or chessboard because they got turned into dust in Infinity War. And just this movie has a much different feel because, like I said, Infinity War felt kind of more like your traditional bring all the different groups from across the MCU together and see how they interact and watch Thor and Star-Lord have, (laughs) you know, little funny conversations and see all these interactions. But this movie starts off with a lot more somber tone because you're starting off, you know... With they all lost. those characters gone, yeah, they lost, and it, like, and then and, and then you know the movie kicks off into gear, and then um, so you know this is also spoiling Captain Marvel. Like Captain Marvel has a post credit scene that actually is not in this movie. Uh, which a lot is, of times they show stuff that then gets shown more fully in the film. Yeah, so that showed a post credit scene that in this movie has does not happen um it's just you know you see after that's already happened you would assume that that was the one thing i think is kind of interesting i've read some stuff and listened to different podcasts discussing i think a lot of people assume that just happened off screen yeah uh which was basically just captain marvel getting to earth yeah Um, because this is a three hour long movie so i guess you know if it wasn't something that was you know directly needed to make the plot it is just you know i mean because a lot of times you just do some narrative shortcuts because there's some stuff you don't necessarily need to show no yeah. um especially if it's stuff as simple as you know a character showing up saying hey who are you who are but you? i think we can say some of these stuff because this is not spoilers has been in the trailer you know tony stark's stranded in space with nebula yeah that was the end uh, of um infinity war yeah so they're in the star lord ship they're guardians of the galaxy ship stranded uh you know on earth they're just kind of a whole at the out. Yeah, just trying to figure you out. You got Rocket do. Raccoon and Black Widow. So you have, because the movie kind of has two parts, really, in terms of like the action that goes on. And this movie doesn't have as much of the action throughout as, say, Infinity War did. Infinity War was once it started to go, which is almost immediately, it just continues. It's almost well, all action. Yeah, because in Infinity War, you start out with the Asgardian ship and you have some fighting there. And then you get to Earth, and not too long after that, there's some fighting with Iron Man and Spider Man and um, Thanos's henchmen. And, you know, just kind of has action throughout as opposed to this one has a little bit at the beginning, but not a lot. And then it kind of gives you like, is the movie playing out? I had tried to avoid as much as I could to not get spoiled on it. And the movie was a much different type of movie than I thought it would be. Yeah. Um, The structure of it, the setup played out much differently than I thought. And some of the stuff like I had no idea going into it was what it was going to do. And that was refreshing to kind of go in and not have all that spoiled because the trailers for this movie are very misleading as to what's in yeah, them. Yeah, they, they really, and that's the thing, it's one thing that the MCU's been very good about forever is like... At least these last two. I, I mean, for a long time, because they, they've always kind of been able to hold things close to the chest, you know, and give you enough to make the movie people get interested for it. But I never watched any movie where like they had a huge plot point ruined in a trailer. Yeah, because a lot of movies will have trailers that show you a lot of third act material... <laughs> Well, and they show you, they basically give you enough in the trailer that you can piece together in your mind what happens, and you'll be 99% right I, most of the time. And it's funny, because one we've always talked about, and Sean usually brings it up, which is, I think, the worst one we can remember in recent memory is the last Terminator movie, because they spoil, like, the big reveal in the trailer. Yeah. And it's like, that the MCU doesn't do that. They're, they're pretty calculated on what they want, and a lot of times they are very misleading, because they will shoot stuff that's not in a movie and put it in the trailer. For the sole purpose of misleading of people. Misleading. Yes, I mean, like, 
from that aspect, I think the war was the worst one because they had a shot of Hulk in Wakanda, and then in, in the actual movie, he was in the Hulk Buster stuff. So and that's, that's one of the things that. And that's one of those things out. where was that a change they made later on after deciding to re re you know configure some of the story stuff, or was that literally them just saying, "Well, let's just throw some stuff in here that's not even in the movie just to throw people off, so they don't yeah. know what to expect." Yeah. And this movie did a little bit of that too because there was some stuff that they did and some of the promotional things they showed that weren't what ended up in the movie well what's your what's your general like thought of this movie i think it's hard to talk about it without spoiling it but yeah. what what were your when the movie is over and it was the first marvel movie i think almost ever that did not have a post credits yes yeah, so there's no so, post there's like a little easter egg at the end yeah. but there's not but and, what, was and it kind of nice is just an audio thing <laughs> was it kind of nice just when it hit the end you could just leave yeah, yeah, because so many of the movies are, this is a movie that's a build up or a lead into something else. And this was kind of one where it's like, okay, as of right now, this deck is kind of cleared and they haven't even announced what any of the movies are coming out beyond Spider-Man Homecoming. Yeah, they. And I know there's supposed to be a Black Widow movie coming out at some point. But uh, that's something, yeah, they've been talking about that for a while. But like, so the movie itself, just like, I, I it's something like I do need to see it again because the feeling there is a lot to watch. The there feeling that I left it. with was like this really wasn't what I was expecting. I mean, it delivered a lot of what you expected at points, but the setup and a lot of the things throughout, it's like, well, this definitely was not what I was expecting. And and it's just the tone of it so different because you're coming in like after they've lost and after all these people have been gone for, you know, a while. So it was just a different tone and everything and like, I didn't come away loving it, thinking it was the best thing I've ever seen. I mean, I did think that it was kind of an achievement. They're able to put together all of this, all of this different, you know, build up from these different movies and characters was able to kind of create a cohesive ideal that then left like an end point that made sense and kind of told a story and brought things full circle for a lot of the characters that did to me like that in and of itself is an accomplishment that we haven't seen happen before in filmmaking. Well, it's funny because I'm usually hypercritical of the MCU because if you guys listen to the podcast, like there's some stuff I really love, but then some of their big tentpole movies, like I'm usually pretty critical and it's funny to hear you come out and say that you weren't necessarily like, you liked it, but you were. And I came out like this is probably one of the so, best event movies I've ever watched. I'm not gonna say it's the best movie ever, but for what this is, for the 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 years that it took to make this, for every single piece, like it it, it was just to me, it was just kind of like amazing they could even get this done no, no, and no. have a good movie because this. Like I didn't come, and I, I I went in spoiler free, which usually I'm I'm bad about that, but I didn't want to know anything about it. And I came out really enjoying it. Now, I'm not going to say that every single thing hit me. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's no. But it, there is a lot of stuff that when it came out. It's like, I don't see how they can ever get close to this again. I, I don't see how anybody can pull off something similar to that. Because, you know, like DC with Justice League tried no, to kind of shortcut it, their it, way to that. Because no. they had Batman v Superman and then Justice League. So they were just trying to, like, introduce as many characters as they could quickly and then put them in a team up movie. I mean, it takes patience and it takes build up because having these solo movies with Ant Man makes him being involved in these larger stories make you know have more impact. Because you know, no spoilers. There's different characters that show up throughout the course of this movie that don't get to do a ton in the movie itself. But knowing their arcs from prior films helps fill in the gaps and make it have more impact or meaning. You know, if they do something big or small. Yeah. And it's just one of those things where. I don't know that we'll see another series that ever attempts to do this. Well, I don't even know if Marvel can do it again because it's just one of those things where it's like I think at some I know they've had like the different phases, but at this point, I almost think that they're going to have these just kind of disconnected solo films, and then maybe they do some more team up movies in the future. But it, like, it just it, it, to me, the undertaking that this was, I don't know where you go from here. If you yeah, have, that's, that's where if I'm the at stake. If the stakes were that half of the existence of populations everywhere you know got snapped away and turned into dust i don't know where you raise the stakes from there um i mean do you raise the stakes to everyone could die i mean if you do that too many times the audience wears out because you're just like oh these threats just keep getting increased and ratcheted up and this is no longer exciting yeah well i I just one of those things where it is very interesting to me to see where they go but i i kind of figured at the end of this i would have like mcu fatigue i I really thought i would because i talked about it before And I came out actually excited for the Disney Plus series to see what that's going to be well, about because you actually have, you know, 
and this isn't spoilers. This is all stuff that's been out there. Like you have uh, a Wanda, or you know, Scarlet Witch series. You have Falcon and Winter Soldier. There's like a Loki series. Yeah, you have a Loki series. So I think that yeah, like, and and two, so there, like you know, there's some of the movies they haven't even announced like what's going on. But like, so if you follow the news whatsoever, like James Gunn was fired from and then hired back to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume yeah. Three. So that movie I'm quite excited for. Yeah. Um, just because it feels like that'll have even less table setting or pulling in kind of Thanos stuff than it did before and give them more to do with it. Not even talking about which characters are going to be in it. Um, just It just feels like they kind of have the shackles off now because there's not building up to these things. Because a lot of these movies were just setting up elements of story yes. for the later and films. I think that's what I, I think that's kind of what I'm excited for because now it's like that that's over with and they're not going to rush right back into something big like this again. I I, I do think it kind of gives each character a little bit of room to go in and just have a movie that, you know, I think you might still have, you'll still have some characters intermingling stuff, but it doesn't have to push a huge narrative forward. Cause like Ant-Man and the Wasp was a good movie. I, I really liked it. Yeah. I mean, like aside but, from the stuff at the very, very post credits end sequence didn't really yeah. tie into the rest of the no, movies at all. It, it didn't, but it did because I mean, it took place concurrently or in the universe. Yeah. These other things have occurred, but it was a smaller scale story. So it didn't yeah. really require the attention of any other characters. No, but what they did was very important for the future going on. So yeah. it's, it would be kind of nice just to have movies that, you know, because like, Spider-Man Homecoming really didn't push any narratives forward. It yeah, I mean, just, the only thing it did was develop out the character of Spider-Man more. Yeah. And then kind of, so, you know, the entire, you know, once again, spoiler for all these movies up to Endgame. You know, Spider-Man wanted to be an Avenger and then at the end got offered to join and decided he'd rather just focus on, you know, the small scale neighborhood stuff. But then in Infinity War in the first 20 minutes, <laughs> then, you know, Tony Stark's like, oh, you're an Avenger now. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> So there's all these kind of things that they do. I mean, like, you know, he had said there's you can't be the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man if there's no neighborhood. Yeah. And so they do have these little moments where you, you know, you have the individual character arcs. But then because, you know, like a lot of the comics will be these crossover events. I mean, some of those got to be so unwieldy. It's almost impossible now to track yeah, down and figure out what's going on. Yeah. But so these the, like these movies like Civil War and Infinity War and Endgame, it feels like they really tidied up and and streamlined those kind of crossover events to where you get stuff to do with a lot of the characters and you don't have as much comic book logic. You don't have as much everybody's out of existence now and then they get this one thing and everybody's back and yeah. there's not as much kind of comic booky uh logic as that is more it's a little bit more grounded now granted it's still comic book based so there's still you know characters flying around but it's not and, any more outlandish than star wars or insert you know lord of the rings or harry potter yeah know? yeah i mean so i mean and there's and and there's not as many in this at least in this one there's not as many deus ex machinas as some different series because a lot of the harry potter movies if you didn't read the books a lot of those movies would end with kind of a deus ex machina it was like something that they just used fixed everything this time travel thing that you never heard about was used throughout the entire book and or the entire movie and blah 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 this doesn't have as much of that. It kind of everything that shows up to, for the most part was built up in prior films or in the film itself. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, just like the main thing I would say is the movie, you know, it has heist elements. It has funny elements to it. It has, you know, character beats. But the but the but the tone of it is much darker and weightier than a lot of the prior films. Because, you know, Thor Ragnarok, even though there's a bunch of, like, kind of heavy consequences for Asgard, <laughs> it was a pretty light film. Yeah, it, it, and, it played more like a comedy. And than, this movie still had a lot of comedy throughout, but it didn't feel as light as some of the other ones because yeah. of the stakes and the world they set up. Yeah, I think that's one thing, too, that I kind of always got MCU is about. Like, it was almost always too light. And this one kind of, to me, was a good balance of both. And I just... Uh, I don't know. It just one of those things. Like I said, usually I have a lot of criticism for these movies, and I just came out of this one. I mean, I went and saw a three hour long movie twice. I think that's something that's really good with this movie too. It is three hours long, but it doesn't. It moves feel, pretty quickly. It moves really quickly. I don't feel like there's anything in that movie that feels wasted because there's a lot of times in movies you watch them, 
And there's like parts you want to skip through. Well, it, like something else I would say is like the screening I was at, there were some kids that seemed to get a little bit restless. And I couldn't tell if they were running up and down because their parents were going to the bathroom or what. But this, like when I was a kid, when I was very young, I remember seeing the original Tim Burton Batman film with Michael Keaton, Jack Nicholson, all that. And I remember as a kid just looking forward to the Batman parts. Um, and then as an adult, you like, you enjoy the overall film and you realize, you know, cause like with the Nolan Batman movies, a lot of the Bruce Wayne stuff was as interesting as the Batman stuff. Yeah. And now as an adult, you watch this movie and a lot of the characters don't have their mask on. They don't have, they're not in their, you know, suits or costumes throughout it. And as, as an adult movie go, you're fine. I do wonder if it, if that, you know, reduces the interest level of any kids who are like, Oh, where's the data's head? you know so-and-so running around doing this the entire well, movie it's funny because it's still kind of the concept that has plagued a lot of movies i i guess since probably the the original uh x-men films and spider-man because those came out right around the same time where they were almost afraid well, the original x-men was like 99 or yeah. 2000 and they did not want to show the colorful spandex no. costumes they and had they, them on those leather suits yeah. and never put wolverine in the mask and then when you go to the spider-man movies they always had him in the, but he took the mask off at any chance he got. Well, because because they didn't want their actor. In well, the they mask. didn't want their star to be in the mask throughout the entirety of all emotional scenes. So they would find reasons to get the mask off, or for the mask to be torn enough you could see their face, because you don't you just don't want to get all of your story, you know, delivered through a mask. And yeah. two, for the actors themselves, I'm sure the actors on sets were, you know, like Tobey Maguire in those movies was saying his lines and giving the performance. But a lot of that audio then does come through ADR and stuff later because just with the mask on, it muffles your voice enough that it just, it's not going to sound good. So almost any time somebody has a mask on, it was recorded later. So I think you get a little bit more natural performance when the mask isn't on. Yeah. Now at this point, you could have some of these scenes where everybody's wearing green lycra body suits except for their neck and face, and they're acting against a big green backdrop and cubes everywhere of, like, foam. So I'm not sure how, you know, naturalistic that performance could be. But, yeah, I mean, like, the performances in this movie are great. Like, Robert Downey Jr. delivers. I mean, you do see his character have an arc that starts from the first film through this one. Yeah, and, I mean, you it's... Know, Captain America, like Chris Evans, delivers a good, you know, great performance. You, you know, see a continuation of that I don't character. Think really, anybody, the only people, like I don't think anybody really gave a bad performance. Uh, Mark Ruffalo, we'll get more of that in spoilers. I liked it. I've heard some criticism from people on his performance, but some of it, I just kind of feel like it was whatever. I mean, I think the MVP of the MCU is Chris Hemsworth, which is funny that when that casting was first, somebody posted something on Twitter about that casting originally and how it was just a terrible plan for him and Loki. Yeah. And then it's like, well, that didn't, you know, that didn't. Well, a lot of casting stuff, people get upset initially, but then once you see it play out, because I'm not sure who they would have wanted for Thor back in 2010 or 11, but you know, perfectly plays this part. And I think Taika Waititi really unlocked what makes that character work best because, yeah. you know, in the first Avengers, there were some elements of him being more comedic and things and it worked pretty well. But then like Thor Ragnarok really unlocked that character to be like dark world was like oh, too serious. And well, that was where they were, you know, cause the first one was directed by Kent Branagh who had done Shakespearean stuff. And they were, I think we're bringing him in <laughs> to make it be like a Greek tragedy. Yeah. And then the second one, they were trying to get directors from, or I think they got directors who worked on game of Thrones episodes. They're going for more of like that feel. And then it's like, well, that's too self-serious. They, you know, the is too dramatic. And then with Ragnarok, with Taika Waititi, who had done what we do in the shadows, they just brought in somebody that was, let a lot of the performances be um, improv and <laughs> a lot of it wasn't scripted and like Jeff Goldblum's talking <laughs> yeah, I don't about like, orgies. I don't feel like anything in that movie of Jeff Goldblum felt like they actually had a script for Like him. if you go back, I, just, I bet like there's raw footage where those scenes play, he just has completely different things. Yeah. Because he was just playing <laughs> Jeff Goldblum turned to 11. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so like the performances in this movie are good. Like Josh Brolin as Thanos is still good. Yeah. Um, I think I enjoyed his performance in the prior film more. Well, I think we'll get he, into that in spoilers. Yeah. I think too, he probably had a little bit more to do in Infinity War. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because this movie is less about, you know, good guys punching bad guys and more about trying to figure out how to solve this hmm. issue. And, and, 
let's do our reviews and then because it's hard to discuss. This okay, yeah. So spoilers. without going into spo- so without spoilers, so just giving it like a score out of ten. So what would you give out of ten? I'm going ten out of ten, and the reason why I mean, first of all, I just think to make a three hour long movie for me to go and watch it twice within a week, you know that I feel like that's great, and then just. Everything, you know, you look at it, 22 movies, including this one, up to this point, to make this movie, you know, I feel like for the most part, most fans came out very happy with it. There are some people that, you know, were mad or over. I just think that for what it was, we'll probably never see anything like on that scale again. Uh, You you know, we talked about this, I think, pre-podcast. Um it might be the only movie that has a chance, I think, at toppling Avatar. Yeah, globally. Um, and I think everywhere, because it's already... Because China wasn't really a factor, I don't think. Well, in the China. U.S., the number one grossing movie is Star Wars Force Awakens. Yeah. So in the and U.S., it needs to basically gross a billion dollars. Yeah, which alone. I think it's very possible they could maybe well, do But that. the other question is, is the fan base for this for, for that series of films kind of finite and it's doing a lot of its business up front and it's just not going to expand out beyond its existing fan base. I don't know. When you make $2 billion, I mean, that's... That, I mean, the other know. thing is like, so I don't know, I'm not sure where if, if globally it's available on Netflix or whatever, but I know like something that did help a lot of these films is being in rotation on the cable channels and, and you know, replays or reruns. Yeah. Because a lot of these movies, like Thor: The Dark World, was on every other day on FX for the better part of a year. Yeah. Because I saw it like, was on the other day. I saw yeah. ten to 15, I've seen ten to fifteen minute chunks of that multiple times. When I like go over to my parents' house and go out and hang out my dad in his garage, he has a TV and it's just on whatever channel. So I've seen chunks of it then. I've seen you know, and then a lot of these movies have been on Netflix. So I think like now, and at least in the U.S. Infinity War is on there, like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Black Panther, so there's a Ant-Man bunch of these Wasp. movies. Yeah, man, The Wasp. So a lot of these movies show up. Now when the Disney service comes out, they'll probably just all be on there. They will be um, from, the, from the start. Which I think for, for them keep, because you know, a lot of times when the sequels come out, they pull the movies off of Netflix. Which is kind of a dumb thing. Which I think was very smart to keep Infinity War on there because people, because I think some of this too, people are going to go watch this movie just to see what the buzz is about. Well, because people can catch up through netflix yeah and that's helped with a lot of tv shows like breaking bad their viewership really went through the roof after they became popular on netflix first so i think that's a good strategy so for me giving this a score out of 10 um like i said just watching it once i'm giving it like an eight so i think it's still a good movie and it's like a huge achievement they're able to, even, to pull these plot threads together and to give you a coherent movie that lands and has any um <laughs> you know, emotional elements to it whatsoever. Cause with so many characters going on and so much story stuff, it'd be really easy for them to have delivered a movie that didn't land and didn't connect and didn't emotionally connect. Cause there's a lot of people that came out of this movie having cried at least, you know, two or three times. Um, you know, it has a lot of emotional moments. I don't know that on like a pure visceral level, I enjoy it as much as like say the first Avengers or, you know, like in game, um, infinity war had a different feeling to me. Um, but I do think I need to rewatch this. I'll probably appreciate it more on rewatches just because what it did was different. Um, but you know, still a a very solid film in terms of like, you know, blockbuster filmmaking. I'm not sure we're going to see anybody pull off a feat that is having so many disparate storylines connect in a way that actually now this, the, the timeline for some of these things makes absolutely no sense when you think about it. Yeah. Cause they kind of, you know, just in terms of, free. just in terms of like what date things happen. And I'm just like, wait a minute, what? Well, Cause uh, even but, Ant-Man the Wasp, like I think it starts off saying like today, which wouldn't make any sense. Cause it's pre infinity war. So, but, but the, 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 the point of all, yeah. like, I mean, a lot of, it wasn't really until the past, you know, with the MCU and some movies that have sequels and stuff, a lot of times movies existed in a vacuum like James Bond where you have a movie happen and then the sequel takes off and almost nothing stuck in the universe. Like anything yeah. that happened in the prior film has been wiped clean. Except for this current slate of Bond films, but the, uh, the yeah, older but like ones. A lot that, of the older yeah, movies, you the, know, a lot of yeah. franchise films did not really have super coherent stories that really built on the others. <laughs> I mean, there was there were there were ones here and there, but it wasn't super common. So yeah. um, I think a movie that comes to mind too is one that came out when you were kids, and it was uh, the Batman movie with Mr. Free. What was the one that had oh, Batman and Robin? Yeah, was that the one that had like Poison Ivy and yeah, Riddler Bane. and Bane? And- no, it was um. So Batman Forever was Two Face and the, okay. the Riddler, and then Batman and Robin was Mr. Freeze, Poison Ivy. 
and Bane. Bane. But those are movies that come to mind when you have like a huge cast of people with a bunch of movies and it just didn't work. Well, they brought you know? in they brought in you know Arnold as a movie star, yeah. and then they tried to build it this universe, but in doing so, they made it so cartoonish <laughs> and uh, you know it, yeah. Because I think a lot of times you need to ground the world you're in, but they just those <clears throat> went so stylistically over the top that they ungrounded it and then just made it where you're like, I don't even know what's going on here. Yeah. There's people w- ice skating down the street <laughs> with neon suits. Like, I don't. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, you think it, it's just funny watching this and that and, and just seeing where how, they've come, where they've come, where they started at and where they've came. Because, you know, really, I guess you could start with the Christopher Reeves Supermans. But, you know, I'm just going to go more contemporary and just kind of look in the 90s and even Batman Returns, which was good. But you, you just see where they where all that stuff kind of started and when they try to get the bigger movies, which is like Batman and Robin and all that. And to see where that was and where we are now. And it's completely different and to see that DC is still having their same issues that they had in the 90s today. Well, like I think they've found that their best strategy is to build up their popular characters and then figure out what to do, not yeah. try to start with the team up because like in the US at least, I'm pretty sure that Endgame made more in its first like weekend than Justice League made overall. Yeah. Now globally, you know, it's still like uh, Endgame's first weekend made more than Justice League's total <laughs> global haul, I think. But, I mean, it's not to sit here and bash DC because some of my favorite films have been, like, the Nolan Batman movies. Or yeah, those, like that. those are still great. But I think know. it's that their strength lies in those characters being built up on their own. In terms of the Marvel films, a lot of the strengths of characters are interacting with others. Well, because I think Thor works best off of all these other characters, yeah. which is even what they did in Ragnarok, as opposed to if it's just him alone. Well, you just think about it real quick, not to get off the subject, but growing up, having the Batman anime series, like, I don't remember many crossover events. Yeah, with they that. were, it was confined it to was Batman co- in that world. And I think maybe every now and then you might have, like, a Superman cameo, or you might have somebody else I think that was radically. I think they did that after I had stopped watching, yeah. and it was after the original run. But uh, then you had, like, but the Justice League cartoon was really good, because I remember watching that growing up. Because well, I then, but it just seems like... Well, then you had, like, the Spider-Man animated series that was on Fox, and then in that series, the X-Men did show up, yeah. and then there was, like, the Secret Wars, where you had, like, Iron Man... Captain and America. Captain America. Well, they even had a... Didn't they have an Iron Man cartoon, too? Yeah. I, I kind of vaguely remember that. He had a Fantastic like, Four. I am yeah. Iron Man. Like, yeah. in the 90s, they tried to launch that, cause they, and they also had a Hulk series. Yeah. Because there was a number of different series they tried to launch in the mid-90s that didn't take off as well, but those weren't on Fox. Those were on like UPN or whatever. Yeah, I just remember, network. you know, obviously the mainstays were Spider Man and X Men. But it, to me, though, like DC, really good animated, you know, their, their cartoons and stuff because Batman Beyond was really, you know, all this stuff I mean, pertains and, more to me because I was. Too, I haven't you know, watched any of the animated stuff from any of these studios in years. Like, yeah. I think I've seen some of the Batman where they've done some of the like one shot comics and they've made like the animated yeah, films out of them. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a handful I've always heard of those. Good things about those. Because they have like um, Batman Year One and different yeah. stuff, but like, um, but back to you know, so you gave it a ten, I gave yeah. it an eight. That that my score could go after rewatching it. Um, it's just it didn't leave me on the emotion. It didn't lead me to the same height. I mean, part of it's because Infinity Warrior already did a lot of stuff, like bringing characters together, and you can't really keep going back to that trick. It doesn't work if you do it a bunch. So, yeah. so now we'll move into our full spoiler discussion where we'll discuss the plot points and characters and things that go on. So if you haven't seen the movie, I'd recommend not listening because it's a movie that really is better enjoyed if you don't know anything about it. And yeah, and I'm going to assume that most people have probably... I mean, it's made $2 billion pretty much. So I mean, I, I'd say a lot of people watch it, but again, if you haven't, it really... No spoilers because it's just... It's it's a very... Yeah, because it's a movie where a lot of it you know, is experiential, but you don't want plot points spoiled because, yeah. you know, so currently it's sitting here with like, you know, over a half billion U.S. and almost two billion worldwide after not too long. So it's doing huge numbers. Like, so I'd be interested to see like what type of legs it has, like how long that goes on. Because there's not really anything that comes out for a while. Well, in, until maybe in May that could you have Aladdin, challenge. I think. And, that's toward the end of May. Yes, yeah, so you have. But uh, a lot of studios saw what was going on and cleared the plate a little bit. It's like, yeah, we don't want to go. Well, Aladdin's that. Disney, you know. Yeah, I mean, so Disney's going to eat their own tail a little bit. I mean, I think there's different audiences, though. But yeah, yeah so full spoilers from this point out for Avengers Endgame. Um, all right. So, you know, you start the movie off and you have Captain Marvel there 
already knows who everybody is and you have thor looking like he's from eight mile <laughs> he has some mom spaghetti yeah um depressed and, thor and then they immediately you know find where thanos is and go and chop his head what, off were you expecting that i wasn't expecting them to get there and but since it was so early in the film i knew that they wouldn't succeed in anything major at that point yeah so they find thanos he has used the gauntlet to destroy all the stones so they couldn't be used again and then Thor chomps his head off and they're just kind of like, oh, and then it, yeah. you know, cuts to five years later and everybody's just in this depressing future. Yeah. And and then which you I know, think is I think it was why well, I kind of gathered because when I go in, when I went watching that and Captain Marvel was talking about what well, you didn't have me. Anything, I kind of figured from that point they were going to go there, kind of get their asses kicked. Maybe one or two of them get killed, lose Captain Marvel and then they would kind of come back with their tails back between their legs. And even, have even to more. do their plan. But they went and then immediately killed them yeah. easily. Yeah. And didn't feel any better about it afterwards. And then Thor's like, oh, I went for the head. <laughs> so Yeah, because Rocket, who's like usually all for everything, he's like, what did you do? Which it's funny to me that Rocket has became, I think, one of the best characters in the MCU, given like what he is, just a talking raccoon. Yeah, because you, know? you would have never thought, t- you know, 10 years ago, you're like, yeah, one of your favorite movie characters is going to be a talking raccoon voiced by Bradley Cooper. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't have you, you wouldn't have thought Based that. on um, Sidney Bristow's little friend sidekick from the show Alias will be a talking raccoon yeah. voice. <laughs> um, yeah, so... So you, you have that, and I was like, oh, okay, so this isn't what you expect. So you have, they don't immediately try to go and reset the timeline. They go and just to get the stones back to undo it, and they're gone. And then Ant-Man shows up because, you know, he, get kicks, he gets kicked out of the quantum realm By five years later because the rat <laughs> steps on the controls. Yeah. And... That kind of stuff, which is funny because this movie is... When you, and, and, and two Iron Man gets brought back uh, by to Marvel. Earth by Captain Marvel. Before... That, before they go to get Thanos. Yeah, so uh, either so either Captain Marvel gets to Earth and they send her to get Iron Man, or on her way to Earth, she finds him. So it's regardless, Captain Marvel brings Iron Man and Nebula, or Tony Stark and Nebula, back to Earth. And then he's upset with Captain Mar- or Captain America that, you know, they didn't work together from the beginning to stop it from happening overall. And then you cut to five years in the future, and you know Tony Stark has a family and a kid and all this stuff. So when Ant Man comes out of the past, or you know, he comes out of the quantum realm, uh, to him it's only been a matter of hours, but five years have passed in the real world. Yeah. So and he's kind of catching up to what's going on. He isn't fully understanding it. So there's like a mont- there's like a little scene of him like with this cart of stuff, yeah, going around San Francisco, and he's looking yeah. at the um, the memorials that are set up, and then it shows his own name as one of somebody that was killed in the snap, uh, and then he goes and finds his now teenage daughter. Um, which is kind of sad that he lost like five years out with her, but yeah. you know, um, and then he goes to the Avengers and he's, you know, to the Avengers complex. He's like, Hey, you know, we worked together before, uh, <laughs> I was in the quantum realm and, and, you know, time worked this way. Maybe we can go back in time. Tom heist, you know, which is funny because infinity war was, I guess, more of a war movie. And then this one is, is a heist. Is, is a, a heist. time heist because yeah. their plan, you know, after doing some testing, you know, and after Tony decides, you know, he figures out how to make it work and then has to decide if he wants to risk, you know, losing his family and stuff to save everybody. So then, you know, their their heist idea is to go back in time to different points and to steal Infinity Stones yeah. and to send people off in groups. <laughs> and so, you know, Tony Stark, Steve Rogers, um, the Hulk, they go back. And hey, Amen. And Ant Man go back to New York because there's the three events. of them at the same time. They go back in into the events of the Avengers, the first Avengers, while the Chitari and Loki are attacking New York. So they go back to that timeline because at that point in New York there were three Infinity Stones. There was the Tesseract, the the Mind Stone or whatever, and the Scepter, and the Time Stone that was at the Sanctum, whatever that Doctor Strange is at eventually. And then. Um, Haw- uh, Hawkeye and, and Black Widow go to Vormir where the Soul Stone is. Which they go and they go with uh, War Machine and Nebula to Morag, which is where First Guardians introduce it. Yeah, edge. where um, Star Lord gets it. <laughs> which in the first actually one. is one of the better scenes of the movie because they show the entire Chris Pratt Star Lord dancing scene. Yeah. But from the eyes of somebody else. Yeah, they show so, it from uh, uh, Rhodey and uh, yeah, Nebula. Yeah, so there's no music to it. And he's like, so he's an idiot. And yeah. she's like, yes. And they and knock then, him out. And then, uh, yeah, War Machine just walks over and punches him and knocks him out. <laughs> and then they take the stone and 
but then that's when like the big you know i guess the the plot element is since there's two nebulas and they have the same internal connections and wireless radios it connects to the same network and implant you know so transfer some Thanos of memories. is able to find out every single thing that's going on through the nebula. future nebula and they and, replace nebula yeah and one of the interesting things on this is going back to new york with the hulk when he talks to uh man what's your tilda swinton i can't think of the name of her character the uh, sorcerer supreme or yeah, whatever, the, before yeah the sorcerer Doctor supreme Strange. they kind of talk about you know taking the stones out it creates a divergent timeline and he's like well what if we bring it right back to the moment when we took it so the the thing is, is like they had to survive obviously and bring back the stones to that point in time from which they took them. Yeah, so the they take moment. all the stones, succeed, and then they return them well, all to when they got them. Now the the one interesting thing though is you kind of have because you have the Ant Man and uh, Tony Stark and Captain America thing kind of goes awry because instead of getting the Tesseract, Loki gets it and disappears. So they lose that, but they do get the uh, the staff. Which is funny because there's a couple of things there because like Captain America, you think there's going to be another elevator fight scene, which is a throwback to Winter Soldier. Yeah, and they set it up, but then yeah. the way that Captain America subverts <laughs> it all. So those elements are really awesome. So he just looks like, you know, the secretary told me to take this. Hell Hydra. Yeah. So and it's just one of those things where me. he has all this knowledge because he's yeah. in the future. So he, by knowing that, just averts the entire fight scene. And it did set it up, but it's the reverse. Because yeah. in the original, and you know, in, in Civil, um, Captain America... Winter, the Winter Soldier, he's the one that's finding out that they're Hydra and they're maybe going to fight him. Yeah. And then it's reverse where he's the one that's going to fight them if he has to. <laughs> but just by saying Hell Hydra, he's yeah. able to convince him to give. But him then he staff. has to fight his past self, and yeah. then he his past self hits him. He's like, I can do this, and he's like, I know, I know. Like he just. And then there's a scene too where Robert Dan- or uh, Tony Stark talks about Captain America's suit, and he's like, "Your ass doesn't look very good in that." Yeah, and Cap- you know, Ant Man's like, "Well, that's America's ass." And then Captain America's <laughs> like, "That is America's and ass." Abby knocks his pass up out. He looks at his butt. And he's like, "It is America." Like, there's a bunch of fun. I think that's where like the Ant Man humor is funny because you know, well, yeah, because get- Scott Lang is fun throughout, and anytime he's on screen, like Paul Rudd is fun to see play off these other characters, and then of course too. So you have to mention. Uh, Thor Lebowski. Oh, yeah, where that he's was essentially. Were you expecting that? I was not expecting for <laughs> Thor to show up with the gut out of shape, dressed like the big Lebowski with the long hair and beard, yeah. wearing schlubby clothes throughout the entire movie. <laughs> it's just, it's a very funny direction to take that because a lot of the promotional material showed Thor in great shape, in the yeah. same shape he was in in Infinity War. So the. I guess the joke is that he just really let himself go. Yeah, he's depressed. He failed. You know, he feels like he's the one that let all the people die. Because if he had went for the head. Yeah, he, or the arm, he would have, you know, but instead he he wanted to make him suffer, so he went for the chest. And it wanted him to know that he did it. Yeah. So you have, like, these elements. So then, you know, Thor is beer belly <laughs> Thor. So the entire movie, he's not in good shape, even when he has his costume yeah. on. I mean, his it, arms are still bigger than anybody else's. Yeah, but, I mean, it's yeah. still shot. But, I mean, like, later in the film, they do just obscure, aside from the one scene where it shows him shirtless they yeah. end up hide him under clothing where because they shot these movies back to back so he yeah. didn't gain 70 pounds no it was just probably prosthetics and you know uh cgi, CGI but it, so you have you know like overweight Thor, <laughs> and he's really not as much of a player in this movie i mean it's really you know iron man and captain america and nebula because and nebula, nebula has, has a huge part she is the third because the rotten tomatoes broke down the screen time per character and it, yeah. was, it was captain america tony stark nebula and so and, it's and, funny and, how Nebula, they really put a lot on her. Because well, she connected it to the cosmic Thanos side. And then, yeah. too, you have the element of, you know, like I said, full spoiler. So they reintroduce Gamora, but it's Gamora from 2014. So prior to the events of the first Guardians, yeah. before she would have interacted with Star-Lord and then joined the Guardians and their team. So they are able to bring, because every character that was just killed is dead. But Loki got the Tesseract and disappeared in when they were in the past yeah and gamora they brought gamora from 2014 back so some of these characters they did sidestep them being dead vision stayed dead yeah. um because the soul stone and all that stuff so because he anybody who actually was murdered <laughs> stayed dead unless so. they pulled some time shenanigans and yeah. then the gamora is the one where um gamora and nebula one point are talking and they're looking at star lord and She's like, so he's the one? It's like, yeah, well, your choices were him or a tree. <laughs> he's like, what? <laughs> so then they're going to have to do the complete reorganization of that timeline or you know, of that relationship 
in if, Guardians if 3. If they go that way, though, because it never really specified what happened to her at the end of the movie. If, I think she just left after yeah. everything ended. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, there's. I think the Thor stuff was really interesting, but it's funny because we talk about Dark World. And even though and that they referenced was, that they went back. Yeah, to there was Dark a World. lot of references to that movie because they went back to that time period in the. So they went back through um, the original Avengers. They went back through the first, you know, right at the beginning of the first Guardians. They went back to um, where else did they go? Well, they went back to the New York. They went to Morag. They went to. Um, then they went back to the seventies with Captain. Yeah, America so then Captain the America, Rogers. and uh, so they went back and got to meet Howard Stark. Um and, and you had a him. Hank Pym uh you had a oh yeah you had Michael Douglas you yeah. know it was Hank Pym so you had these kind of little fun throwback moments these different characters you know Tony Stark got to go full circle and you know finally say goodbye and thank you to his dad because he never got to do that you know as a young adult yeah because uh, we saw in Civil War his parents were killed by the Winter Soldier <laughs> yeah. uh, by Hydra so he got to go back you know and have a chat with his dad and kind of give him a goodbye without letting him know who he was or what was going on. And so those moments were fun. So you had like the little heist moments where they're going through the the events from the end of the first Avengers. And, you know, the plane was going according to what they had planned out until, until the Hulk Tony had, Stark got knocked into by the Hulk. <laughs> yeah, because the Hulk had to take the stairs. So then Loki got the Tesseract. Yeah. Um, now, that's where it kind of falls apart. And then that, you know, they go back and plan. T- yeah. So the plan was for Captain America and uh, Iron Man to go back in time to a point where the Tesseract and Hank, and Hank Pym, they had the Pym particles, Pym particles that at they the same place at the same time. And then, um, you know, of course, you have to mention that Black Widow sacrificed herself to get the Soul Stone, which I, that was actually kind of a fun scene, though, because it was like her and Hawkeye. Well, fighting you had each the, other. you had the announcement they're making a Black Widow film. So you felt she was relatively safe. And then they pulled this kind of switcheroo. And you're like, oh, actually, she's not. Yeah. And so is it all a ruse? I don't think it is. But I think there's no, something. I mean, like her character could be dead and it's just a prequel film, which, which is kind of an interesting approach to take. But I, I, to me personally, like that makes me less interesting. But there is there is the element of when uh, Bruce Banner, after he tried to use the gauntlet, says, you know, I tried to bring her back. Yeah. Um. So he could have brought her back. She's just not on Earth. Yeah. So there could be something like that going on. But um. Yeah, so, you know, the first major death of any of the major Avengers was Black Widow sacrificing herself for the Soul Stone. Now, that was a little telegraphed when they sent Hawkeye and Black Widow to Vormir, and yeah. Hawkeye has the family to bring back. Because they're like, well, he's the one that actually has people to be waiting if they succeed. Yeah. So, that element, but it still, it was like a big moment. And she's you like know, one of the main characters that's been there since Iron Man 2. Now, what about Hawkeye? I mean, was he, because like, you know, we didn't even talk about the cold open of this movie, um, which I think really family. set the tone. It was, it was <clears throat> very good, because he's on the farm. You know, he's still, which is where the timeline gets a little murky, because Ant-Man was already off of house arrest by the time the snap happened hawkeye wasn't so maybe he got more time on house arrest or you know who knows they yeah, could, yeah so but that's just something i thought uh, because i just watched amen well, maybe Wasp. he just wanted to stay with his family and hang up everything yeah but he's but anyway because he still had the bracelet on his leg they made sure to show that but then anyway like his entire family gets dusted so he's had terrible luck he lost all yeah. of them but i think that's pretty effect pretty effective because that just sets the tone of like this is Infinity War because Infinity War starts off like even though it ends very dark, it's pretty fun and light throughout. Yeah, because even though it ends with everybody, you know, or half the population can turn into <laughs> you dust. You still have like Rubber Man Man playing with Guardians of the Galaxy and all, all yeah. that stuff that happens there. And you have like the entire like Thanos planet fight scene. There's a lot of goofiness that goes yeah, on. Yes, so, I mean, there. there's but the, the tone that was set up. So you have a lot of inner. It's like, you know, Hawkeye, I thought, did a good job of, you know, giving him something to do in this movie. Yeah. Um, I guess since. You know, Black Widow got more to do in the prior film. He got more to do in this one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, you know, they they finally succeed in bringing back all of the uh, the Infinity Stones. They get him back to Earth, but because of Nebula's double timing, she opens up the portal for Thanos to come through with his ship. Yeah. To present day Earth. And and that's where I was saying, like, in the, the prior. So the version of Thanos in this is not the Josh Brolin version from the Infinity War. No, he's, he's a kind younger. Of, it's a, you know, it's a younger version before he's went through all this stuff. Because in Infinity War, he is a little bit more, um, a, you can identify with him a little bit more. And, like, well, maybe some of the stuff he does have a point. In this one, he's more pure villain mode. There's not as much nuance to the performance because it's an earlier version of him. Yeah. And he hasn't had to sacrifice Gamora. And he hasn't had to do all this stuff. Um, but you know, the, 
they come through and then he has all of you know the Shatari things that he that they use from the first Avengers that come through like the big flying ships and yeah. all the alien monsters and well, you have all of his henchmen show up that he had killed. Well, Tony Stark makes the gauntlet. They put the stones in it. The Hulk is the one that snaps because he's the only one that think he can survive it. Yeah. So he snaps. And then right after that, you know, Clint Barton gets a phone call from his wife. Ant-Man notices like there's a whole lot more wildlife outside. And then they get and then, the Avengers then, compound blown up. Yeah, because you see at the same time, Nebula, who swapped places with the other Nebula, came through. And there's there some people that had issue with that because like, well, you know, because she didn't go back at the same time that war machine did but even in their own thing is like she could have took three years to do this yeah, if you have the bracelet you could go back yeah no but the thing is is like from what i understand is like three years doesn't matter like it, it, as soon as she hits the button she goes back to the same time so because she showed thanos the pin particles yeah so they had enough time to probably replicate them because you know something they don't really describe accurately in the movie is like thanos is essentially a genius as well as everything yeah. else so if it took her one week, four months, the same amount of time would have trained. It, it would never notice. Yeah. So, you know, they come through. Um, I'm trying to like I said, so Black Widow dies. Yeah. And that's like a big moment. Um, and then so when they get back, they realize that she's not there. And of course, that affects Bruce Banner. Oh, and like, you know, he's Professor Hulk. Where yeah. He's the combination of the Hulk strength with his intellect. Yeah. Um, which is something I know the comics did at different points. I think he's not as strong as the pure anger Hulk. Yeah. Uh, but still, you know, very, very strong. <laughs> but doesn't really do a lot of fighting, and no, he does. And I think people had a lot of problem with that too, because I think a lot of people like in the because we're almost to the final battle part because we've set it up where they, you know, Thanos shows up, destroys the Avenger complex. But it's like everybody wanted like each person to get like their some, hero moment, and it's like, but that that's you know some of them did, but that you know that be so damn long is every single well, character and two, and lost. Two, to be fair, if a character survives this film, they can go on to do stuff in other movies. And the Hulk's yeah. got plenty of moments where he smashes, and it's only you know CG fight stuff is only so interesting. Yeah, but it's like people wanted each like almost each character to get a moment. It's like well. They might not because, you know, it's not how it works. I mean, they could have they could have had a scene where uh, Professor Hulk tries to hook up a black widow (laughs) and she's like, you're going to crush me. Yeah. And then Um, Disney probably wouldn't like it. No, they wouldn't have done that. I mean, uh, yeah. So, you know, Thanos shows up with his army from, you know, his ship and unloads his full army to fight everybody. And it's essentially just like Iron Man and Captain America. Because Rocket, War Machine and the Hulk are all trapped underneath and Ant-Man has to go rescue him. Hawkeye's running, running away from the Shatari with the gauntlet. Yeah. So, you know, Iron like, Man. So it's kind of like the original, the big th- I guess the big three. You have Captain America, Iron Man, and, and Thor then, all and then you, And then as Steve Rogers is sitting there, then on his, you know, this was the big fan service moment that, you know, like audibly through the audience, people are like, oh, because you hear Hawkeye, or um, you hear. Well, um, before you, before that, you have the big fight. And I don't know if you're talking about this or not, but you have Thor getting beat up and he's about to get killed in the same way he tried to kill Thanos in yeah. Infinity War. But they do a shot to Mjolnir, if that's how you say Mjolnir. it. And then you see it get picked up by Captain and America. And then, like, so that was kind of hinted at Ultron. Well, Captain America, like, summoned it and it worked. Yeah. Uh, which was, like, an awesome moment. And he was so, using the hammer. Which that was one of the coolest moments in the movie because he beats the hell out of Thanos for a minute or two with the hammer. But then, you know, Thanos eventually gets the upper hand, destroys the shield, beats Captain up. And this is where you're talking about. Like, Captain America gets up. And he has, he's like, got only a, half the shield. Yeah, he's got a huge gash on his arm. And he's it's just him, because everybody, Iron Man and Thor have been defeated. So it's just him looking down, entire Thanos' army. And then you hear, like, the radio come on and say, on your left. Yeah, and it's um, Falcon yeah. and... And then you see all these portals open up from Doctor but Strange. And the first bring, three people to walk through, I think, because yeah, Black Panther. In my audience, there was a younger uh, a family from me, but had some younger black kids with them, and they were so hyped when they were the first three to come through, which is yeah. cool because we because well, we talk about this like there's not been it, what was cooler than that you know they have those three people walk through and it's yeah. like because you knew in that walk through it's like oh okay like, so then you saw you know like Black Panther come through yeah. and then you saw and then like the big moment you know, like, so you had a lot of big to moments to me that was a big moment because that was like when, when those three walk through like oh okay like they yeah. they know what to do so you, you, know, you, you know, know you had Falcon come through you had Black Panther come through you had Spider-Man swing in yeah. and then all the Guardians uh, yeah so then but like when Spider-Man came in that was like a big emotional thing because you know of course him and Tony Stark yeah I think, too, though, especially for people, and I'm not saying that younger kids don't have an attachment to Spider-Man, but we were talking about this before, like, when we grew up, the animated stuff was Spider-Man. Yeah. One of the first big movies was Spider-Man. Now, it's not Tobey Maguire, but still, I think a lot of people, especially in our age range, 
I have a big if, you so know, that, that was, was one of your favorites. so that was like the fan servicey moment when yeah. all the characters showed up. So you had you know all the Wakandan army, you had all Which of the cool. remaining yeah. Avengers and characters and the Guardians and Spider Man and um, Scarlet Witch and all these people show up. And then you have like the cool moment where Thanos is like looking at Scarlet Witch. He's like, "Who are you?" Blah blah. blah. And she's like, "Well, you'll remember after this." And she yeah. like starts she pretty much shredding him, just shredding him. And then he has to have them start shooting. You know, have his ship shoot down all the yeah. The, so they're all. He says, "Rain fire," and like everybody's just getting destroyed at that point. And then Captain Marvel comes through and yeah. destroys the ship. And then there was a moment too from this part because at one point like Clint still has the gauntlet and he's trying and to passing get, it off. He passes it to Black Panther. They're trying to figure out what to do with it. Ant Man's van's still there, so their theory is just to get it back to the past, get away from Thanos. So at one point you kind of have like a game of keep away because like Black Panther takes it away from Clint and then Spider Man and then Spider Man gets it and then it goes and then to Captain Marvel. Would you finally get to see the instant kill mode because he has the still has the Iron Spider suit, so yeah. he's getting he kills all the Shatari. Yeah, he's like turns it on yeah. kill mode and, and then after uh, they do the rain fire and Captain Marvel shows up, she introduces himself and she's like, "We have something for me, Peter Parker." And he gives her the gauntlet. And this is the moment I think a lot of people had problems with or some of the social oh, when it was warriors, uh, because, the lady. Because the he's like, well, characters. how are you going to get through all this? And I, I mean, I only think like it is Valkyrie and uh, Wasp, Pepper Potts. Pretty much all the women. You know, you got, you got the Wasp, you got Valkyrie, you have Mantis, you have Potts and her rescue armor. And, and like, well, uh, she's got help. And, and the, yeah. And some people had problems with that. And it's like, well, you know, they had to have their woman. woman. It's like, well, that was cool because... Little girls usually don't get that. You it's know, like, they're all cool characters. They're not lame people. Yeah, like anybody you know. that has a problem, like if you have a problem with that, you need to re-examine your life because <laughs> nobody gets mad when a team of dudes shows up. Yeah. Now my only thing is if you if your critique on it is that Marvel has not treated the female characters correctly, and you know by dusting everybody in Infinity War, you took out a majority of your strong female characters that could have been useful in this movie. If you're going on that critique, then I can maybe get into it. But if you're just mad from the social element, then it's like, get out of here. Because I, 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 I don't would want ladies to save anything. Yeah, like, I would listen to the argument, like, because I even had a problem with that. It's like, well, they, they killed all the cool female Well, like, because Wasp didn't get enough to do throughout yeah. a lot of these movies. But the, but the point well, was... Well, like, you lose... Like, Scarlet Witch is somebody they've never effectively used through any of the And movies. they've really alternated how powerful or not she is yeah. because uh, Vision and Scarlet Witch kind of got their asses kicked by Thanos' henchmen. Yeah. But then she alone almost destroys But I think, Thanos. too, though, you could also go by, like, you know, They got and, ambushed and... And, yeah, but my thing is, is, like, if your critique is that they haven't necessarily treated... Because, uh, for example, Captain Marvel was their first female movie and they've been doing it... That was like their, what, 21st movie, and they yes. had 10-plus years. So it's like, if you go on that so critique, that, I get it. There is that level. But like if anybody's mad that just you know the women team up to help each other for a while, like that's just yeah. a garbage critique. It was just a fun moment yeah. that just watch the audience coming out and see the little girls who come out and are pumped about it and say that they did something that was, you know, like, come on. Yeah, and um, again, it's cool because like this is what we talk about too, like especially growing up at the time period, a lot of – girls didn't get cool female characters and now they, they get always- an entire subsection of these series and going forward there'll be more movies and Man. stuff like that so you, you know you had the moment like where that happens and then um the van gets blown up yeah. so they don't get to take it back well, in time but well, actually one of the cooler moments of the movie is the emotional or is like the reunion of iron man and spider-man because yeah. like He's about to get attacked by something. And you see the web catch it and yeah. then throws it to the ground. A man stomps him. Yeah. And then they, like, Iron Man hugs him for the first time. So it's yeah. Yeah, kind of funny how they, with, with uh, Iron Man, Tony full Stark. Because before, like, I, uh, Spider Man hugged him in the beginning of uh, Homecoming. He's like, no, we're not there yet. And, and that's just where you see that, you know, like, that's like a big connection because yeah. Tony Stark is kind of like a father figure for iron or for spider-man and you know he was kind of he felt responsible for his fate so you have that you know emotional moment which is and and then you have like the continuation of the fight and you have you know all that stuff going on and you have where thanos gets the glove on and, and then captain, captain marvel, marvel stops him from snapping yeah. it because like one of the cool scenes is she just you know because she's strong she, they have their first superman problem but, you know, she's like essentially just holding his pinky and thumb where he can't close his hand. So he headbutts her, doesn't do anything. And then um, so he grabs the power stone and shoots her with. Yeah. It. And then, you know, he's about to snap and he's going through his little speech where he's inevitable. And- well, yeah. So the so another thing, too, was at one point, um, Iron Man, you know, Tony Stark asked Dr. Strange, he's like, you said there was one chance out of however many million that we won. Is this the one? 
He's like, well, I can't tell you what happens if it, if I tell you what happens, it won't happen. Yeah. So then Tony Stark, you know, I guess just assumes that they're in the one. Yeah. Um, and then you know, Than- so then but he, he looks at Doctor. He Strange. uses the Power Stone to knock out, or he uses uh, Thanos uses the Power Stone to knock Captain Marvel off. And he puts it on. So then, you know, Dr. Strange tells him, like, gives him, like, the sound of, like, one. So I guess, like, you're in the one scenario. So then Iron Man flies up and is fighting with Thanos. Well, he grabs the gauntlet. He grabs the gauntlet. And since it's his own creation, it transfers all of the stones. But you don't know that until, until the sex. So you see it transfers all the stones from the gauntlet to his suit. And then he's standing. No, actually, Thanos punches Tony Stark and snaps. Yeah. And nothing happens. And then he looks at the glove. Yeah. And there's nothing on it. And then it. Tony Stark, so you see all the cause, stones. Because, yeah, Thanos is like, I'm inevitable. Yeah. And he snaps and then nothing happens. And then to do the callback to the biggest moment from the end of the very first MCU film, <laughs> when Tony Stark's line was, I am Iron Man. Yeah. And that ended the first movie and set up the entire MCU. And this movie, you know, once he gets all the stones, he looks at him and says... You know, he's like, I'm inevitable. And he's like, well, I am Iron Man and snaps. Yeah. And that was cool for it. it was like, and then you see all of Thanos's soldiers turn to dust like he did to everyone else. Yeah. And then you see them like, you know, Thanos turn to dust and go away. Yeah. So they took, you know, they ended, they punctuated the biggest bat, you know, a big battle scene with the biggest line of dialogue from <laughs> the thing that set up that series, yeah. which I so think is very full circle. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, um, and you know, then like Pepper has her moment where she like, which is her armor was pretty cool too, but she has a moment where she like, you know, Peter Parker has his emotional moment kind of like an infinity war, but the yeah. reverse. And then Pepper is like, Oh, you can rest now. And then Tony yeah. Stark dies on the battlefield. Uh, did you like how they, cause I, you kind of knew that Tony Stark wasn't going to make it through this. You know, you knew well, that cause you knew that contract alone, like he, he would be paid a hundred million dollars. They did another movie. Yeah. So like he, he was pretty much done at this. Do you think that his character was done just as like, were you happy with his character arc and how it ended for him? I mean, I think, I, I think they did do his cause he started off being kind of a selfish a-hole who then slowly learned to do things for the greater good. And then in this movie he had to make the decision before they even went back in time. Do I just live my life now or do I go and save everybody? And Pepper was kind of like, well, you, can't not do it you will you will do so i think they had a satisfying arc of where he went from being selfish because in the first avengers he did do the selfless thing of took like the rocket up into space or whatever yeah but this is one where he knew the consequences he knew when he used the gauntlet what was going to happen yeah and he knew and that's why dr strange saved him you know or or gave the time stone to save him yeah because he knew what his role was eventually so you had all that element. You had the element of, you know, he got to have a kid and the life that he wanted for a few years, but it was in a kind of semi post apocalyptic world. Yeah. But he got to have, you know, the life of Pepper and a kid. And then I think too the conversation he had this dad kind of cemented like what he had to do. What he had to do because some of the stuff his dad had said, I guess it kind of clicked with him. But I, I think overall well, his too, the, the, so another element is like the time travel stuff. So I guess the way the time travel worked out was they, if they went back in the past and stopped things from happening, that would only create a splinter reality yeah. that had a different outcome, but their current reality <laughs> well, would stay the same. As Paul Ru- or as uh, Scott Lang says, uh, "Back to the Future's bullshit." Yeah. So because uh, they uh, they they went through and used some movies to discuss, you know, <laughs> how it worked. It was out. all the Star Treks and Back to the Future, and there was something else too because it was like him, him and Hot uh, Tub Time Machine. Yeah, Hot Tub Time Machine. <laughs> Uh, which I Don Cheadle is a really I feel like I'm pretty under- sure that that kind of breaks things though because I'm pretty sure that people have been in so Hot Tub Time Machine sequel Hot Tub Time Machine two had Adam Scott yeah. who was in Parks and Recreation with Paul Rudd yeah so well and Paul Rudd was in Parks and Rec with, with Chris, Chris Pratt. Pratt so uh yeah I mean it is funny <laughs> well two uh they Lebowski exists in that universe because Jeff Bridges point, was we, uh the villain from the yeah. first Iron Man but it's funny though because like the uh, Robert and Jay, when Tony Stark walks by Thor he's like move out of the way uh Thorbowski yeah or whatever so in that universe the big Lebowski exists but, so Jeff Bridges so I guess that Obadiah Sane or whatever his name was the villain from the first Iron Man just bears a pass resemblance to the dude yeah so it's, it's just funny how that kind of breaks at some points i mean there's yeah. like a bunch of things like the show the office michael talked about the show the wire and then idris elba and amy ryan right yeah, so yeah you break a lot of realities when you reference pop hey, culture idris elba is in yeah he was him doll yeah, so yeah. you have all these different which his character is dead because he got died murdered. before yeah. the snap so yes so 
I think that Tony Stark was giving an arc was given an arc throughout the course of the series that made sense and resonated. And, you know, it wasn't just like a throwaway moment. It was a big moment where he got to give, you know, an iconic line, knowing what was going to happen, achieve their ultimate goal, save, you know, they brought everybody back and they stopped Thanos from doing anything further in the future. And that was a very powerful moment. And then you had like the funeral where you got to see all the payoff of the different characters there. The one thing I will say that thinking about it afterwards, taking out the timeline confusion where the timelines of some of this stuff doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, So if they just brought everybody back that was killed by the snap, if there's five years where there has been half the population, there wouldn't be enough food being produced. There wouldn't be enough. I do think that something is going to, because the thing too, people always say that, but all the, because it, people keep thinking in context. Maybe when they, it wasn't just people, it was everything. everything. So maybe they, maybe they, when they did the snap, it was more than just bring back all the people, bring back all the people, bring back all the resources, bring back all the, because they, the, the deal of the snap was to bring things back exactly the way they were before the snap. Well, no, it was to bring the people back because they weren't rewriting time. They're in the, five years later timeline yeah. bringing people back so the other question was it showed at the end peter parker going to school yeah it's like so what about the classmates that didn't get snapped are they all just like They've 22 all, now yeah they should be 22 and graduate uh, so, so. Or, or however old they were 20 yeah. um uh, 21 which i mean i think that will be what's going to be tackled i guess in the next phase of marvel because it's spider-man be. far from home yeah uh now because kevin feige said the next movie in the series that the last movie of phase three or whatever is spider-man far from home yeah now, I guess the big thing to talk about is the Captain America dilemma. And this has been the thing that most... Because he... So after Tony Stark's funeral, they're going to let him use... They're going to send him back in time to return yeah. the Infinity Stones to, to where the, they belong. And the Mjolnir, or Thor's Mjolnir. hammer. Mjolnir. Mjolnir. I can't say it. Thor's hammer. Because, remember, Thor took it from the Dark World, so that has to go back to... Yeah. So they send him back, and uh, you know he goes back, and when they're supposed to bring him back from his time travel, they say he went past. And they couldn't find him. And then Bucky's like, hey, look over there. So him and Sam walk over to a old Captain America. Sitting on the bench. bench. And then, you know, there's the passion of the shield moment where Falcon now becomes Captain America and Steve Rogers got to live out the life that Tony Stark told him he should go live. And, and he got to live with uh, his one yeah. true love with um, yeah. Peggy Carter. And then you get go back and they show like in the 40s where he's having a dance with her. Or and, the 50s or whatever. I, in the think past. It, I think the car that driven by was from the 40s. So. Okay. I think it was post World War II. Yeah, post World War II, and which I think again, like for pure fan service, that was a really great moment for Captain America to end his story arc. But I, personally, though, because of the stuff they did with the shenanigans with Scott Lang earlier, they sent time through Scott Lang. Yeah, like I still think I would not be surprised if five or ten years from now, the MCU still think that maybe have a Captain America bring him back or something. Well, you can always set but, stories now in the past, and he's yeah. there in like the 50s, 60s, 70s. Yeah. But I'm saying, like, I I don't think he's. I don't think they're going to use it. If they ever do, it'll be five or 10 years. But there's a Tony Stark is gone I, because people are talking about him. It's like, no, he, he, his, he, died. he definitively he's dead, died. Dead. He's dead. Uh, but if, anyway, because if you undo that, it undoes a lot of his character. Now, did you have an issue? I personally didn't. We'll get into a little bit of it. But did you have an issue with the way that Captain America ended? No, I mean, because he succeeded and. I mean, knowing that Chris Evans didn't really want to return to that world again. I know they had done some back and forth where he was like, oh, I'm done. And then he was like, oh, no, I'm not done. I'd love to do 10 more. Yeah. I think that was just them trying to backtrack and make it not tell, telegraph to people what was going to happen. Yeah. Um, but and I, I, he did get to go back and be with Peggy Carter. And I wonder if he told her about how he made out with her, like, great niece or something. Well, see, there's a bunch of weirdness that goes on in there. Because, like, then they never, after Civil War, she's never brought up again. You know, because she was in Civil War. Yeah, and she and passes she, away. No, no, no. The uh, Her niece or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, Because yeah. she was in Winter Soldier and but in Civil Peggy War. Peggy Carter herself was in it yeah. as an old woman. Yeah, but then like her, you know, then that, that character of the niece or whatever is kind of like his love interest never gets brought back up after Civil War. Yeah. So. Well, I guess uh, like with Captain America, he, had, he, he accomplished what he ultimately wanted and just wanted to be able to experience some form of life because he really didn't get to experience, you know, because he went from being skinny, scraggly Steve Rogers to Captain America, and then immediately got frozen after the war, and then he's Avengers. So really didn't get to experience much of life, so he got to kind of go back and do that. So that was a nice moment where he got to go and live out his life, and then I guess he's still around, just his old man, uh, mm-hmm. but you know, having Falcon become the new Captain America, 
it's a cool moment because it's a character we've had a lot of build up for that hasn't got to do a ton, but now we get a chance. Yeah. And, and Anthony Mackie is pretty cool. I like him a lot. I, mean, I, I think. didn't, I didn't have a huge problem with that. I mean, I did love Chris Evans portrayal of Captain America. So it's kind of sad. I don't get to see him in future movies, but I mean, they did give him a satisfying conclusion. Yeah. I think a lot of people would too, because this is where like the time stuff gets all screwy because they're like, well, and there's all sorts of theories. Like, you know, there is the prevailing theory that somehow when he went back in time, he went back to the actual timeline they're in so there's like two Captain Americas and then he just because they always kind of or did he go to a different timeline and then after Peggy passed away, then came back to the present? Yeah, um, because but in, in uh, Winter Soldier, they had talked about a husband of hers and they never gave his name or showed a picture. Yeah. So there's always like, so was, did he go back and overwrite her history? <laughs> well, th- I see. I don't think he would. So that's what I'm thinking. Like, you know, everything in the MCU, what we saw from the movie kind of happened for a reason. Yeah. So I don't think they're going to have, I don't think if there's something that's that tight knit and everything's thought of that they would just throw something like this. I mean, I have to do a little bit more thinking or reading about that. I may listen to the commentary, but I mean like, cause if the idea is he went back to like post world war two yeah. and found her and they were together, but it was like that version of the past. Yeah. And then he stayed there until, you know, she passed away and then he's towards the end of his life and then he comes back like, I don't know. It's it's all slightly confusing. Well, you think about it, or was he just on the bench because he was back and he knew at that year and that time to go there. But yeah. then that just says he set out and let his other Captain America self in the world do a lot of stuff. Yeah. Which is just an interesting thing to think about. And it's more of like an emotionally satisfying or a story thing over a logical thing that you can sit yeah. there and explain. But I think, you know, too, though, I guess he could think if he went and got interfered with anything then that stuff wouldn't happen so it's like is there a version where he just was there the entire time and just set out because like you think about it like if that's to be true like his character at that point in time would be well over 100 years old you know because he has a super soldier serum so he doesn't age like everybody else so he would be over 100 years old at that point uh yeah so I don't know. I, I just think that's the only... There's a couple time conundrums that exist. You know, it's like the Loki that escapes with the Tesseract. Like, yeah, where is he at? You know, and, and that's what he'll be in that Disney Plus series. And I think it'd be interesting, too, to see when he takes the Soul Stone back and has to interact with Red Skull. You know? Yeah. He's like, oh, you Nazi. <laughs> yeah, so it'd be kind of funny. Just It'd be interesting in itself if they could ever do a limited series. Or maybe he just, just went to that planet and just drops it and then leaves. Yeah, which you don't know. I mean, it'd just be kind of interesting to see how he goes back and does everything because he gets to go to uh, Asgard and he gets to do all these different things. So, I mean, I think overall, like, if you don't nitpick it, that's the only thing I think with the Well, movie. then the thing is, if they now have the ability to go back in time, like, yeah. are they going to utilize that in the future with the Quantum Realm? Like, are they going to go back and screw up other stuff? Yeah. Because that's one of those things, like, the Harry Potter movies have time travel, then, but then, like, in the movies, they use it a lot in one movie and never go back to it. Yeah. And it's like, well, why don't you just use that? So, I think they do kind of have to, in the future, be, like, explain why they wouldn't use it. Yeah. And, and two, like, will there be more Ant-Man movies? Will there be more? I, I definitely think they're going to get one more. I mean, because the, the previous Ant-Man movie, while it wasn't like it was successful, it was on the same level as like some of their other franchises, but it still produced money. You got to go. They're going to do another Ant-Man. Yeah. I mean, or two, some of these characters could filter through the Disney Plus shows, yeah. um, which would be like a lighter time commitment for some of the actors because they could just go in and do a few episodes with taking. You know, which just, I think I'd be interested in that because that's where some of your smaller. I think Ant-Man would probably. Since he had his own movies, I don't think he would do that. But characters like Winter Soldier and, you know, like that would make more sense to put them on there because you can still develop them and have them in the big movies and stuff. But you don't have to have a movie about the Winter Soldier. And two, they didn't. They ultimately did not bring in the characters from the Netflix shows. Those shows are all canceled now. So and now, though, with the snap and the bringing everybody back. Like you can have, there's so much more to play off with that too. Is where they, I think the future of the MCU is very interesting in what they have to do. Well, and too, like, so the movie ended essentially with uh, Thor being a member of the As Guardians which, of the Galaxy. Yes, which, which that I was, very much look forward to a Guardians three if Thor is a main member. Yeah, which I think that's really interesting because, again, like. They, it took them very long to realize, and that's the, thing, the wonderful thing about the MCU is it's, it took them a long time to figure out how to use Thor. And I see the same problem with Captain Marvel. While I do like Brie Larson as Captain Marvel, I don't think they figured her out yet because she's only done two movies and all the Infinity War stuff was shot before her actual movie. Yeah. So 
I think as time goes, she'll probably move more over to the straight man character where she's because like comedic stuff, I don't think works best well, for her. Because Thor, you know, they played up. He is, you know, male ego and all these different <laughs> things. And they that utilizes him the best. Yeah. And I think with her character, I think they uh, giving her another movie where they get to show more emotional range and give her like a real emotional arc will do yeah. a lot for that character and really solidify where that goes. But I think for her, I just think Brie Larson probably works better serious because like the joke, she can do it. But I think she is a kind of like she's going to be more like the Steve Rogers type where he can do humor but his best stuff is when he got to play it straight. Yeah, and one thing that's interesting in this movie um, that Julie and I were talking about afterwards is it uses shit. I, like, I'm sure they use whatever their allotted amount was for a PG-13 yeah. film because they use it quite a bit. Well, I watched, And then Captain America even uses it when yeah, in the first cha- movies he would have been like, don't swear. Yeah, it was changed a lot because he had the first openly gay character in the MCU where they had, it was actually one of the Russos talking about. It was one oh, at the, the therapy me- session? Yeah, and then like, it's just funny seeing the change of Captain America uh, but I don't know. I think it will be. I think that as Guardians of the Galaxy is something I'm very excited for because if th- that's the direction it ultimately goes, oh, like I the think, James Gunn, I think they're going to go because I, I think all that stuff makes sense because they played so well. I don't know how big James Gunn was involved in this because he got his Marvel. Trouble. Well, this would have been shot at the same time, so he would yeah. have whatever level of influence he had would have probably been the yeah. same. So I think if he had the influence on that, because you see how well and they all were back in the MCU yeah. directing it. But. So that's something I'm really excited for, and to them be able to like not have the constraints of the Thanos storyline, yeah, because. I think obviously there's going to be a search for Gamora because that's what Peter Quill was searching for. Yeah, before. it's going to be like the search but for Spock, Star I, Trek. Yeah, which but I really love though when Thor gets on there and they're kind of discussing who's the captain. And Peter Quill's like, like, I'm the captain. He's, he's like, 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 yes, yeah. You are. He's like, yeah, you are. He's like, but I am. He's like, yeah, sure, you're the captain. It's just <laughs> funny because like they really found out how to work Thor. And if that's where I was going to, like the MCU understands how to change the character arcs. Well, and, and two, like it was funny because they didn't really show in, they didn't show like in the, so like, you know, Thor had the, you know, five years to live with the guilt of not going for the head or the arm with Thanos and stopping everything. Um, but like, you never get to really see Star Lord. Cause he got uh, dusted. Since you know. he got dusted, but you never really get to see him like. Uh, if I just hadn't gone off the rails and hit him, then we would have gotten the gauntlet off and won. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing, though. If they even if they had gotten the gauntlet off, Thanos could have then maybe still beaten all of them and taken it back or something. Yeah. Who knows? But, you know, so you, you get but the main arcs for the movie were Captain America and Iron Man, because those yeah. are the really characters that were like the linchpin of the you know, like you Thor might got moments, too. I mean, like, everybody, Widow everybody had their moments. Hawkeye. Everybody had their importance because like. Ant Man was the time heist. Tony Stark, you know, every single character had their kind of important part, rather how big or small it would be. Yeah. But I do think overall, I kind of thought I would come in and leave the movie with MCU fatigue. And I haven't. And it did leave me excited for some of the movies yeah, that have coming out. It, it definitely left me excited for it. Like now, like I've kind of talked about this with you and Sean, and uh, well, actually not you as much because you just saw it. So, yeah. <laughs> but, with, you know, with Spider Man, uh, I don't know if I'm excited for that or not because there's something about this current iteration of Spider-Man, I think because me and you specifically and people in our age or anybody that listens to this podcast, since I've been 11, I'm trying to think, Spider-Man came out in 2001, right? Yeah, So since I've 2002. Turned, 2002. So since I've turned 12, depending on when it came out, I've had three Tobey Maguire Spider-Mans. I've had two Andrew Garfield. Two Andrew Garfield. Then I've had, I'm trying to think, then you had Tom Holland, but I had Tom Holland in Civil, Civil War, War, Homecoming, Infinity War, Endgame, and now I'm about to have him fifth in, movie. in the 10th total Spider-Man movie, or well, the, movie with Spider-Man in it, since I've been 12. One, two, there was also just the PS4 Spider-Man game, which I yeah. really loved, but like, so that was Peter Parker in his, you know, 20s. Yeah. Um. So a lot of the iterations of Spider-Man that we're used to are Spider-Man where he's, he's in his older. 20s, you know, he's in college, he's post-college, or the at least the actor playing him in the case of Andrew Garfield is like my age. Yeah, which um, I don't know if that's maybe some of it too, because like I enjoy the characters of like Thor, Peter Quill, Gamora, you know, Ant-Man, the Wasp, and stuff like that. Even though, like, some of those characters are way older than me, I probably identify more with them because well, I'm not... Well, I'm and, an and there's some characters we never... Like, we didn't get to see Ant-Man in, interact with Star-Lord. So there's always, like, yeah, interaction. Yeah, which I would love to, to have see. seen that, yeah. Or, you know, I, and it's too, like, I thought it was really funny that Drax didn't call out Thor for being fat. Yeah, well, I think he disrespects Thor so much that, yeah. like, they don't... Because uh, in the first, in Infinity War, he's like, that's a man. Yeah, he's like, you're just a dude, this is a man. He's yeah. And then they end up calling him the angel pirate, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's why I think, too, seeing, like, 
that was because that was James Gunn humor. Yeah. So like that's why. Well, I then think, Rocket was like they killed my entire family. The girl with the antennas. Yeah. And blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so there's a lot of fun moments, and Rocket is like a really fun well, character. Which real quick, do you like Rocket's more? Because uh, like not that he's a huge comic book character, but they went back to his classic design in this one where he has like the little suit with the boots on. Did you like the boot? Rocket. I didn't really pay attention. Yeah, because he has like because you go back and look at the classic iterations of Rocket from the early days, like in the seventies when he came out as a character. Like they went him took him to that. Yeah, which I really like the scene where they go to New Asgard and it's him and Hulk. Yeah, and because uh, this is something we didn't talk about. Uh, so he goes and steals the um, the Soul Stone out of at Natalie Portman. <laughs> yeah, which, which I'm assuming they got like archival footage no, or no, they re actually, new footage. She actually showed up and did like a day for one day. Yeah, because <laughs> I think they had some speaking roles so, to cut that down. So they she kept, was at the premiere. So Captain America has to go and put it back into her. I don't know if he does that or if he goes and gives it back to him, you know, because like he'd probably, depending on how it worked out, if it just needs to be for the moment you took it. So if he just show back up and gave it to the Rene Russo's character, like right when Thor and Rocket left. Or if he shows up and injects, I don't know how yeah. that works. So. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff on that, that. But anyway, it just, again, like if you told me that some of my favorite characters coming out of this movie would be like a, you know, just in general, like a talking raccoon that's angry. And I don't oh, know. So when Thor took the hammer, he didn't know they had to go back to all the timelines. So he just took it from yeah, that timeline. Yeah, he just took line. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it got returned, I would assume, by Steve Rogers. Yeah. yeah. So so I guess we kind of covered all the story stuff. I mean, Iron Man got his story wrapped up. Captain America got his story wrapped up. Uh, Black Widow, question mark. Yeah, I mean, I I hope that when they do her solo f movie, I hope that it's not a prequel because... I just don't want to see that, you know. I don't. But the really... only other thing is um, requiring you to have seen all of these films plus Endgame does require a bit more knowledge going into it. Yeah, but we'll see. I mean, maybe I'll do like so, like the show Better Call Saul, which is kind of a prequel to Breaking Bad, has moments before and after this series. Yeah. So maybe it does that, where it's a prequel story that gives you hints at what happens yeah. post Endgame. That, or if like somehow there's one way they could do this is to have the which I don't know if they're going to do this or not, but have almost the the Black Widow movie be more uh, cosmic and then somehow intersect with maybe... Well, like I think the, she works best as a character who's on Earth. Yeah, but I think she, if they return her to life, she would still be on that planet. So if you could just have... And you, a lot of this stuff usually set their post-credits. Yeah. So like if there was just like a scene that... I could see that maybe leading into the next Guardians movie or something. Yeah. Because if it goes like a prequel to the current day where she's still alive or something, which... Because she's only like 32. So you look at like, I don't know how big of a commitment she wants to this, but I keep forgetting that she's between our ages. Yeah. So well, you look at a lot of the characters, you know, some of them are going to be in there for a long time. Or it's like Paul Rudd and I think Hemsworth is still mid thirties. Yeah. Cause let's see. Yeah. Cause uh, Scarlett Johansson, how old is she? Cause I know like in the Olsen's like, so she's a um, little under a year older than me. Yeah. So, I mean, she's fairly young and can continue. I mean, a lot of people that. can keep doing them. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so we'll see what happens with her character in the solo movie and where that goes, but yes, yeah, so I guess that'll wrap up our discussion of Avengers Endgame. I think we covered all the major points. I mean, there's a lot you can discuss. I mean, there's so <laughs> much. With time this, travel stuff, there's always yeah. a lot of things you can sit there and like people do flow charts and maps and like, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is a movie that, again, this is where I go back to is like such an event because you could literally do three or four podcasts on this movie and still have stuff to talk about. You could break down each thing independently and it wouldn't be boring to me you know and maybe other people would be i wouldn't want to do that but i'm yeah. saying you could because there's so much material you know yeah. so i think that'll do, wrap up our discussion of avengers endgame if you're listening via itunes or any podcast app please leave a review for us helps other people find the podcast you can find all the stuff we're doing at houseofbasestore.com find links over social media accounts to youtube vimeo instagram facebook all that stuff now, our YouTube channel, so um, I think last time our, when we recorded the last series of podcasts, we had mentioned that uh, the short film Plucked we had, it gotten a lot of views. Now it's like at 700,000 views. That's awesome. Uh, and it gave a bump to a bunch of our other ones. N not to the same extent. You know, they got a few thousand extra views, but <laughs> got a big bump in, in subscribers and views off of that because it really caught on. So you can check that out on our YouTube channel. Um, all of our other uh, short films are there as well. Um, and if you want to find us specifically on the internet, you can find me on Instagram at the William Caps. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Metaworld Derek. And that'll wrap up this episode of the House of Visor podcast. Thanks for listening.